But let's move on to the lecture. So it's a great pleasure to have Timothy Caulfield here as our speaker. Um, and uh, Timothy is a Canada Research Chair at the University of Alberta um, in Health Law and Policy and uh, has a, a distinguished uh, career. He gave rounds for us early uh, today and spoke about uh, starting out in his career in the early 90s, uh, which is nice to hear, actually, because it makes me not feel quite as old. So, uh, so I started in the late 80s, so, so that's, uh, that's good. So uh, uh, a distinguished career. Tim is very active on Twitter. Uh, so at Caulfield, Tim is his uh, Twitter handle. Uh, so please feel free to tweet during the, uh, the lecture uh, about the contents of the lecture. We're using a the hashtag of uh, C2E2Lecture. So if you want to tweet, please feel free to do that. Um, as I said earlier, uh, Tim's uh, uh, tweets are uh, often accompanied by hashtags like hashtag SI and uh, SIGH and uh, hashtag UGH, U-G-H. So uh, feel free to use uh, some innovative uh, hashtags as we, uh, as we have the, the session. So it's uh, a great pleasure to have, as I say, a great pleasure to have Timothy Caulfield as our lecturer, and uh, I'll pass over to you, Tim, and uh, we look forward to the talk. Well, thank you very, very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. When I got off the train, all the buses were busted and everyone was complaining. I thought it was going to be empty. So it's already a success as far as I'm concerned. Really appreciate it. And holy cow, what an honor uh, to give this lecture, uh, especially given people that have given it before. So thank you very, very much to the entire organization for this opportunity. Uh, talk about that I love topic that I've been buried in over the last, uh, last couple years, uh, and that is the impact of celebrity culture, the impact of pop and how science is represented. I, I think this is an important topic, and I think that this is an interesting time to be talking about it. I mean, think about it. Never before in human history have we had so much good science but at the same time, never have we been surrounded by so much baloney, so much bunk. It is really absolutely everywhere. Stuff about beauty, about fitness, and about diet. Uh, I don't, I'm going to go through a lot of this stuff, you guys, so bear with me. Uh, we have stuff like the Beckhams, and they put bird poo on their face. And by the way, they really do that. Nightingale bird poo, so it's very sophisticated. Thigh masters. Now, you guys all look way too young to remember the thigh master. I remember it. Uh, it's sort of the iconic moment in bunk uh, equipment. Uh, Suzanne Summer in that product. Then we have, there's so many more on celebrity diets, uh, but this is uh, Jennifer Aniston's latest diet. Have you guys heard of this? This is the baby food diet. So, it, and it's not to be confused with adults drinking human breast milk, which is a real diet. People are doing that today. Or uh, the guy that drank his wife's breast milk for an entire year, which is also a real thing and made for very awkward lunch dates. But, <laughs> uh, but there is all this no noise out there right now. So you have that kind of stuff. And then on top of that, all the stuff we hear about gluten-free, all the stuff we hear about organic food, all the testing, and stem cells, uh, and it becomes an incredibly, incredibly confusing atmosphere to try to make decisions about health. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that I find so fascinating about this topic, because all of that stuff, all of that noise, this multi-billion dollar industry, I mean, you just the diet industry, which is like $30 billion in the U.S. alone, all of that stuff is focused on how to live a healthy life, right? What kind, what kind of things we're supposed to be doing as individuals? I'm not talking about socioeconomics. I'm not talking about uh, picking your parents, <laughs> your genetics. I'm talking about the things that we are, can do ourselves. This industry is focused on that. And I really think, and see if you guys agree with me, and I say this every time I have the opportunity, I really think we need to do 
things to live a, take, to live a healthy lifestyle. These six things maybe take us 95% of the way to a healthy, a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and these six things apply to most people in the population. Uh, everything else is either complete bunk or just on the margins, right? So start thinking what these six things are. Ridiculously obvious, and that's kind of the, the point, right? That because popular culture pulls us away from these things. But there really are just, I think, six things. And we'll come back to them at the end. But before I start, I, I want to do a little bit of a bunk up. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through some of the absurd things that are out there. I'll do some things that are quite more serious and, and start with some things that are very frivolous. But giving you a sense, because you do seem like you're very sophisticated, you probably are not aware of the stuff that's out there right now. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, and then I, I want to uh, tell you why I think this is important, why I think this really does matter, and I think it does matter. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about how we got here. Why are so many people listening to this noise? Why is there this, this breach in trust? between, uh, between uh, popular, the, po how, how the world sees science and, and where uh, science is coming from. And then finally, I want to talk about the things that we can do as a community to try to fight this. So let's start with our bunk warm-up. And of course, I have to start with my friend, Gwyneth Paltrow. Hey, Gwyneth. <laughs> I've looked at her for like four or five years since I've started this project. And Gwyneth, Gwyneth is special. She's like a gift to me because... <laughs> The bunk just keeps going. Like, she's remarkable. She's a gift for Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, so Gwenna started about a year ago. <laughs> Perhaps one of the worst bits of health advice ever. Do you guys know who this one is? Gwenna knows it. Yeah, shout it out. Deeming your vagina. <laughs> you didn't hear this? You guys didn't, know? You didn't hear this? No? So this is her advice that is relevant to all of us, well, most of, well, 50% of us are supposed to do this. Um, and her advice was, and by the way, this was like a gift to me, because this advice came out uh, about two weeks after I released my book, uh, Is Gwyneth Paltrow Wrong About Everything? And it was, <laughs> thank you, Gwyneth. <laughs> I spent, I, I did like 40 interviews on steaming vaginas. I'm not kidding. <laughs> How did I get here in my career? But so what did, what did here's Gwyneth's advice. And this is real. Uh, this is a quote from Gwyneth. You sit on what is essentially a mini throne, and a combination of infrared and mugwort steam cleanses your uterus at all. I love the at all. I don't know. <laughs> What's she talking about? Is there any gynecologist here? Um, so you have that kind of advice. But Gwyneth also has, do you guys know the, her website, Goop? So she has a website, Goop, which I go to every day. Uh, and on, <laughs> on that website, she gives advice on how we're supposed to live. Her do, she has this do section, the things we're supposed to do. And here's just a, a taste of the kind of stuff that she recommends. One of the things we're supposed to do is we're all supposed to get tonics as often as possible. And I actually went to, I met with her doctor in L.A. I can't believe he agreed to meet with me. And he told me that too. I should get a colonic as often as I possibly can. And why do I need to get a colonic? Why do you all need to get colonics? So you're learning something already. It clears the toxins of modern day life, which is a really common theme in popular culture, this idea, this idea that there's toxins out there. To eliminate the extra mucus. You guys know we had extra mucus in our, our clay? We do. Uh, and, and when it comes out, it looks like tarry black mold, right? So who wouldn't want to get that out of their system? That's what a message. Is there any evidence to support this at all? Of course not. So you get a red X there. Um, here's another bit of advice from Gwyneth. This one is a beauty one. More recent, quite recent, actually. I don't know if you heard this. Gwyneth recommends that we all let bees sting our face, Right? has this anti-aging property, right? Also, anaphylaxis is just so rejuvenating that it would seem like you know, it's a good thing to do. That trip to the ho hospital, you know, the adrenaline. Um, <laughs> any evidence to support this at all? Absolutely no. Uh, and here's another one. She's always big on diet, giving all this diet advice. Then huge on detoxing, which I'll come back to. Uh, this is her, uh, she goes on a detox every, uh, Gwyneth will be doing it soon, won't you, Gwyneth? Every January. Um, and here's what, uh, Part of her of detox, uh, it, this detox soup helps clean your uh, kidneys. It cleans your brain. impressive, uh, and and it gets rid of all the excess water. Any evidence to support this? Of course not. So, what other kind of bunk is out there? See, I told you this is going to be a warm up. What kind of other bunk is out there? Well, this is a very recent one, and one of one of my favorite. I hope you guys heard this latest health trend. It is cryotherapy. 
You guys heard of this? Cryotherapy, yeah. So the cryotherapy, again, trend, I, I, all these things I think wouldn't exist but for celebrity culture. So cryotherapy is being pushed by celebrities all over the world. Lindsay Lohan, if you want to know what happened to Lindsay Lohan, she's in a cryo chamber in New York City. <laughs> and there she is in her cryo chamber. Uh, and the idea is it's anti-aging properties. It'll help you. Uh, it helps with inflammation, all these kinds of things. Of course, athletes are big on this. Here's LeBron James getting his cryotherapy. Um, and uh, you see it. Why are you supposed to do this? What's the evidence? And here's just one example from a cryotherapy uh, company. It helps with... Uh, Helps your circulatory system. It's good for your nervous system. Uh, all of these things. Any evidence to support this at all? No. Big red X there. Uh, in fact, in fact, there's been a cryotherapy death uh, in Nevada. Uh, a woman died in one of these chambers, uh, and the FDA took uh, a, an unusual step. And I think we need to see more of this, issuing a warning about cryotherapy and how there's no evidence to to support it. Uh, it is kind of interesting though, because I'm from Edmonton, right? And you guys are experiencing this today. <laughs> I live in a crowd chamber. You know, I don't need to pay for it. That's me riding my bike home, actually. My wife thought I was nuts, so I took a picture of me. Um, give you kind of, the kind of things they suggest crowd chambers can do. It'll burn 800 calories in three minutes. Yeah. Ridiculous, right? Uh, they're, oh, I went back up. <laughs> Just to let you know, <laughs> I'm fighting the fight for you guys. I went in a cryo chamber. That's me in a cryo chamber about... Um, about three weeks ago in Chicago, um, and I'm not making this up, minus 152 degrees Celsius, right? That's how cold it is. And guys, there is shrinkage involved, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty substantial. That's the look on the face right there. <laughs> um, so we have that, that trend. This is another one I find fascinating, and this is relevant to uh, Vancouver, very popular here. This is IV therapy. You guys heard of this? Yeah, of course you have. It's Vancouver. <laughs> so this is the idea that we're supposed to hydrate using IVs, but also we're supposed to get all of our vitamins and all these other kind of electrolytes and stuff through IVs. And here's getting her IV therapy. She's very big on it. Um, of course, again, athletes are very big on IV therapy, and they talk about it. Uh, and then the companies itself can use those as endorsements. Um, why are we supposed to get IV therapy? Because it'll help with all of these things, you guys. Look at it's really remarkable. It'll help with your immunity. Everything boosts your immune system. Um, your, it'll help with jet lag, of course. Your en energy, that's another thing that everything helps with. Uh, depression, that kind of bugs me that they've got that up there. I mean, that's quite a serious um, issue. All this kind of stuff. Here's another great example. Uh, oh, by, the, oh, by the way, I believe that is a Vancouver, uh, that was from a Vancouver website. Um, here's one. I think this one's from Calgary. Uh, I love this one. Now, this is, a, this is a tanning salon, right? So you can get your infusion, your carcinogenic infusion first, right? Uh, and then you can get your, your IV therapy after, right? So again, pushing this idea that it's fast, it's that we all need to be doing this, that somehow we need to be getting our vitamins this way. Is there any evidence to support this? You know, no, absolutely not. In fact, in fact, um, it's not even a better way to hydrate. So when you see athletes getting, getting an IV therapy, you know, they're taken off to the locker room to get their IV therapy, it would be better for them to drink it, right? But it's become so popular, it's become, you know, this idea that it's valuable, uh, it's so you get a red X there. So uh, again, once again, because uh, I'm always trying to test this stuff, I got IV therapy recently, that's me in, in New York City, um, uh, getting my IV therapy the day after the election in the U.S., <laughs> So I did feel like I needed some detoxification. <laughs> um, but interesting, so you see the, the woman in the middle there? She gets it every week. She spends thousands of dollars a week, a month on, on IV therapy um, because she believes it, it helps her. Um, a, a good example of bunk. Here's another example of bunk, um, uh, cupping. So it was, the, it was the cupping Olympics. It was the cupping Olympics. It was everywhere. And again, a very good example of how a fad can take off. You have Michael Phelps getting cupped, uh, and this takes off, right? And you start seeing it everywhere. Uh, here's Gwyneth getting it, of course. Uh, she's in this too. Ooh, and I love, I love how they feel like they've got to wear something to display it, right? Um, and you have Jennifer Aniston, and I'm sure there are a lot of Beeb fans here. <laughs> um, here. Here are his cupping marks. Uh, the Blue Jays 
had some cupping done. This was, I think, the second last game that they actually won. Any evidence to support this at all? No, there's not. We can have a conversation about that after. There's no evidence to support this. So no, no, and no. Um, but again, I always like to walk the walk. So I actually just got cupping done in Hong Kong. Uh, so I went to the heart of, of cupping. Uh, and there I am getting my cupping. Uh, and that's what it looks like. I still got the marks on the back. Do you guys want to see? No. <laughs> uh, just to try to experience it. So those are the, that's some of the nonsense we hear. Here's another phenomenon that I think is absolutely amazing. This is an amazing phenomenon. The, the staying power of this phenomenon what is, uh, is incredible. And, and what is it? So here, here's, here's Michael Douglas on the Jimmy Fallon show. And this is a, almost a direct quote. He's saying, Jimmy, I look so good because I'm gluten-free. Right? It's incredible how popular this is, has become. And, and if you look at some of the data on this, so you don't have to read this carefully. Just, uh, the red line is uh, the, the United States. And if you believe this data, about a third of the population is trying to go gluten-free, is gluten-free. Uh, it's re remarkable, really remarkable. Now, the numbers in Canada are not quite as strong. You see over 4 million Canadians uh, are trying to go gluten-free or try, I think they should go gluten-free or have they reduced. Uh, so these are huge numbers. So we're not talking people who are celiac, who obviously need to go gluten-free. It's a serious condition, which is about 1% of the population. And this isn't even that more controversial diagnosis of no celiac gluten sensitivity, right, which is still being debated in the literature. You know, there are clinical studies going back and forth on that. But we're, there we're talking about another 1%, 2 3%. These are people that are going gluten-free because they think it's healthier. It's healthier uh, inherently. Or because they think it's a good weight loss strategy. And is there any evidence to support that? No and no. There's not, of course. Uh, here's give you a sense of how popular this has become. Uh, very popular with athletes. Um, so you see athletes all over the world going gluten-free. To give you a sense of the number of athletes that are doing this, this is a study actually, um, I believe it was from Canada. Uh, I know some of the um, authors on the study are from Canada. You have 41%. Um, so this was over 900 athletes, and some of them are Olympians and world champions. And you had 41% of that, that cohort are gluten-free, which is incredible. And, why, and what I think is interesting is why do they go why do they go going gluten-free because they think it's healthier, and they think it reduces inflammation, and that's un unclear what that really means and why that is inherently healthy, uh, and that it will enhance performance. So these are really amazing numbers, right? Uh, and then you look at what the evidence actually says. Does it actually have performance? And the answer is no. So we're going to give gluten-free another red X. Uh, so what about diets? And I'm going to turn to my buddy, Tom Brady. Now, I'm... I'm from Boston originally, so I bleed Patriot Blue, right? I really do. If Tom Brady needed my kidney, I would leave this lecture hall right now, <laughs> take it out, and mail it to him. That's the kind of Patriot fan I am. So he breaks my heart all the time. He's testing my faith with his bunk. <laughs> um, come on, Tom. Uh, the greatest quarterback of all time. Now, what's his, his bunk? He has uh, his, this, this brand called TB12, and he, he, he pushes all this baloney. Uh, and one of them is his diet. Now, have you guys heard about Tom's diet? So he doesn't, he's never had coffee. Can you imagine that? Never had coffee in his life. Um, I can't get to 8 o'clock, right, without coffee. He's never had coffee in his life. Uh, and he has this really strict diet. Uh, he has no white sugar, no white flour, no MSG, no caffeine of any kind, no fungus, no dairy, no nightshade. So extremely restrictive. And because he is the greatest quarterback of all time, he, uh, other athletes are looking to him, and other sports teams are looking to, to Tom, and this has become very popular. Uh, in fact, the Maple Leafs, I don't, do you guys know this? They've tried thinking about adopting Tom Brady's diet um, because that's what's wrong with the Maple Leafs. <laughs> 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 Too much kale, right? They don't have, you know, if they, if they ate more kale, they would, they would score more. So any evidence to support this? No, this is sort of a variation on that alkaline diet, right, which you've probably heard about. There's no evidence to support that. And of course, I could go on and on about various forms uh, of, of celebrity diets. For most people, you know, it's just not relevant. You stick to the basics. We'll, we'll come back to that. He, he, by the way, of course, had a book that he was selling. It was 200 bucks for the book. And... 
Uh, it was sold out almost immediately. So there's a hunger. There's a hunger for this noise uh, out there. So let's turn to some more of the that's being pushed in popular culture. Uh, and of course, this anti-vaccination is one of the best examples, right? And the anti-vax noise just continues to flow from popular culture. It's unending. You see it absolutely everywhere. Here's a very recent example of it. Uh, this is a well-known uh, UK um, celebrity. She's, like a, she's a host. Um, talking about, and what infuriates me about almost all of these articles is it's presented in a very uncritical manner, right? It's not even, it's not even false balance, right? It's portrayed as if she's making this informed decision about why not to uh, you, uh, uh, vaccinate her kids with, with the HPV vaccination. So you have that kind of stuff. You have this kind of nonsense from Robert De Niro uh, supporting his uh, decision to, to uh, film... Uh, to show the film Vaxxed, which was an anti-vax film, really straight-up propaganda. Um, and then you have uh, stuff like this. And, and this um, reality show star is always you know, talking about uh, her anti-vax position. And again, from, from my perspective, what's so fascinating is how it's presented in a relatively uncritical manner. False balance at best, but full-on uncritical portrayal at worst. Uh, and then, of course, speaking of worst... Um, you have this kind of portrayal, right? Now, this used to be kind of a funny um, uh, slide. It's not so funny anymore, right? We have, uh, as the president-elect, an anti-vaxxer. Did you guys know that? Yeah, which is absolutely heartbreaking and infuriating. And he has supported the idea, both on Twitter and in, in his speeches, the idea that there's a connection between autism and vaccination. And as this room knows, there is not a stitch of evidence to support that. Uh, but he continues to, to push that kind of idea. Uh, it's very easy to give Donald an X. In fact, let's just keep going. Right, guys? <laughs> uh, but uh, what's, what's problematic, of course, I really believe that celebrity culture has played a huge role in the spread uh, of these kinds and other kinds of misinformation. Uh, and look what's happening now with Donald Trump and, um, and the anti-vax community. I don't know if you knew this, right? Uh, so it's very, it's, it's terrifying. Um, it's easy to, to point to the United States, but here we have our own problems in this domain. Also, this was a study that was done <clears throat> by a friend and colleague, Josh Greenberger uh, at Carleton, and he found that in Canada, uh, one in four Canadians have some degree of vaccination hesitancy that's associated with concerns about mental health or autism, right? Which is astounding, and I really believe celebrity culture plays a central role in this. So one of my very favorite examples of, of the impact of celebrity culture is this one, because it's so absurd, it really wouldn't exist but for celebrities. Uh, and it's everywhere, it's everywhere. <clears throat> and this is the idea of cleansing and detoxing, detox diets and cleansing. How many people here have at least heard of this idea, this concept, everyone? Has someone not heard it? Yeah. If I had asked that question five, six, seven years ago, I think I would have got a different answer. Like there would have been a, a room that was split. But because of celebrities and their love of this idea, it's everywhere. So here's the beautiful Katy Perry, and she's on the cover of Vogue looking fabulous. And she said in order to get ready for the cover, she went on this kind of cleanse. And she had, took all these supplements, which we'll come back to. Of course, no evidence for that either. And she didn't drink coffee, et cetera. She went on this cleanse because she really wanted to glow for the cover, right? That's why she did it. You know, it's not the Photoshop, it's not the lighting. <laughs> it's not the genetics, Katie. Uh, it is the cleanse, right? That's what did it for her. But <clears throat> this idea is absolutely everywhere. And to give you some idea how pervasive it is, I did this Google Trends uh, analysis. And again, I know this isn't that uh, robust of a study. This is a flavor of what's going on. Uh, and I, I looked at the word detox, cleanse, and, and dieting. And what's fascinating, one of the things I think, the bottom line is the blow up of the dieting one. One of the things that's fascinating is how predictable us humans are. We're just so predictable, you guys. Uh, that's January, right? <laughs> so we're all like, you know, I'm going to do it this year. And then we, it dies out, and I think at March, it goes up again, and then we give up. You can see how the trends play out <clears throat> and how detox, this idea of detoxing and cleansing has become more popular than dieting, which is an interesting sociological phenomenon uh, in itself. Uh, as I said, you do see this absolutely everywhere in some infuri infuriating areas where you have people pushing detoxification 
for cancer, right, as a cancer treatment. Uh, you see it, uh, kids, it uh, being pushed on kids as a way of treating cancer. Uh, it's often portrayed in the popular press relatively uncritically. This is uh, something that we're looking at. Um, you see it uh, everywhere um, in the connection with immune boosting, which is just nuts idea. Um, and again, just a couple examples. This top one, uh, they suggest in order to you should get hydrotherapy, which is code for uh, a um, colonic, by the way, uh, and that you should go on some kind of dietary cleanse. This next, this middle one, is really infuriating, I find, because they suggest that getting the flu, you should let yourself get the flu, because it's, that's a form of detoxification. It's a form of natural detoxification. You should bring balance and harmony back to your entire system by getting the flu, right? And your body will be revitalized after you have the flu. How many people a year die from the flu, right? I mean, that's a horrible, dangerous advice. I mean, that's a spread of misinformation. Uh, and then this, look at this last one. Again, these are all naturopaths, by the way. The last one, also really infuriating, where you have um, people suggesting, look at this. If you have been vaccinated, if you have been vaccinated, you guys, you're going to have to spend your entire life detoxifying from that assault on your body. Uh, again, this horrible kind of messaging around detoxing. And then again, it's everywhere in sports performance. This idea that we should detox in order to perform well. Um, and be why? Because you need to release these toxins. Uh, it is absolutely everywhere. Uh, and this is one of my favorite examples of how pervasive it is. There seems like there's a detoxification published 10 a day. <laughs> it seems like there's like 10 a day. There seems like there's thousands and thousands of detoxification books. I've just organized... Uh, some of these for you uh, in descending order of urgency, okay? So you've got your one-month detox, your four-week detox, your 21-day detox, your 14-day detox, your 12-day detox, your 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one-day detox. <laughs> if you guys started yesterday, you'd be glowing for me today. <laughs> but I have a 30-second detox for you. Yeah. <laughs> I did it right before I came up, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> and I think I'm glowing a little bit for it. But, uh, the re one of the reasons I love this topic, though, is that I don't have to equivocate. But, you know, we can have discussions about some of the things I, I research, you know, what the evidence says. But we talk about detoxification and cleansing. It's complete nonsense, right? There's absolutely zero evidence to support the idea behind detoxification. It's absurd on every level, right? It's absurd that the idea that we have these toxins residing in our body, and if we release them, we'll lose weight. In fact, that's what, that's what Gwyneth's doctor told me. Uh, thanks for letting me know I needed to lose weight. And then uh, it's the absurd on the, on the level of the idea that, that, we that somehow these regimens are going to help your livy, liver and kidney, which, of course, do the de detoxification for us. And it's also absurd on the level that um, these regimens have been studied in any way. Um, it's not like Gwyneth's the detoxification I went on, has gone through a clinical trial. How is this regimen actually going to detoxify your body? Never any sort of evidence presented how that's going to play out. Despite that, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, it's absolutely everywhere. Healthcare providers are providing it. Now, this study was a study of naturopaths by naturopaths, so they can't say I'm being biased. Uh, and this study found that 92% uh, of naturopaths provide some kind of clinical detoxification. Now, we did a, summer, a similar study looking at Alberta and BC and got very similar numbers. So it's, you know, it's really everywhere, this idea. How, why is it there? There's an intuitive appeal, I think, around it. It, of course, is uh, celebrity endorsed. There's this idea, there's this idea of purification that I think makes it seem really attractive. Uh, and there's also this idea, I think it sounds science-y, right? Detoxification sounds kind of real. It sounds like something that you'd want to do. You know, who wouldn't want to detoxify? So I think that's one of the reasons there is so much appeal. But I also think it's because it's increasingly tied to, and I'll come back to this for other topics, to real science. Um, this idea, for example, that uh, we um, have to worry about our microbiome, our, our, our gut, bacteria, right? Uh, and that is a real and exciting area of science. They're doing fantastic work, interesting work in the, air, uh, in the area of the microbiome, 
But what's happening is these people who are selling these products are tying the detoxification to that process. And in fact, once again, Gwen's doctor did that for me. Somehow, going on, on this detoxification was going to reset my microbiome. Uh, and the other thing that's happening is that microbiome idea is using, use, increasingly being used as a way to lose weight, right? Uh, in fact, have you guys heard of a fecal transplant? Now, fecal transplant's a real thing if you've got C. diff. You know, if you have a severe uh, intestinal infection, you might need a fecal transplant. But it's being marketed as a way to lose weight. Um, in fact, you know, it, it's based on this idea. Uh, there was a mouse, there's been animal studies where you take um, the fecal matter from a, a, a skinny mouse and put it into a larger mouse. Have you guys heard about this? And the larger mouse loses weight, right? Have you heard about that? So as a result of that, now people are thinking of using this to lose weight, right? To use this detoxification in a way to lose weight. In fact, there is do-it-yourself fecal transplant kits. <laughs> yourself fecal transplant kits. I'm serious. Here it is, the power of poop. That's what you need. So I'm not really sure how this plays out. Like, <laughs> you find a skinny friend. <laughs> you invite them over. <laughs> so Stan, can you come? No, it's not dinner. Keep an open mind, though. <laughs> Um, this is everything you're supposed to need, the shopping list. I love that they have Lysol. Because things don't go well with Stan, you can clean up in a blender. Uh, anyway, uh, that's a real thing. You can Google the power of poop and you can see it there. But this, again, is playing on, on this idea of detoxification and using science to sell uh, something that's bunk. And I'm going to come back to that. Okay, so there is all this stuff out there. Now I want to convince you guys that this matters. But there's evidence that suggests this matters, and there's lots of evidence out there. Now, first of all, uh, um, it, this impacts all of us. It's not our crazy neighbors. It's all of us. Popular culture has an impact on all of us, and there's some speculation as to why that happens. Now, this is just sort of informed, informed speculation, uh, and there's this idea that we're all evolutionarily predisposed to follow celebrities. Have you heard that argument before? It's true. So the idea is as follows. For most of human history, there was an evolutionary advantage to, follow, to finding someone who had prestige and to learning quickly from them because they had prestige because they were a good hunter or had some evolutionarily advantageous skill. Right? So that was the idea, and we're left with the biological remnants of that. Uh, again, hard to study that empirically, but, but it, it is intuitively appealing. Uh, there have been other studies, and this was a nice piece by Stephen Hoffman, a friend of mine at the University of Ottawa, who looked at all of these sort of economic, psychological, sociological forces that, that nudge us all towards unconsciously to following celebrities or being influenced by celebrities. Uh, there's also a very rich literature on social comparison. Humans are, are very much social comparison machines. Uh, and because of that, we can't help but compare ourselves to celebrities. And again, for most of human history, we would compare ourselves to a relatively small cohort of the people that lived with us in a village, and now we're social comparing. You know, we have social comparison machines, right, that we carry around and look at all the time. Uh, we're comparing ourselves to that damn Tom Brady and to Kim Kardashian, et cetera. So that's, that's some of the theory. But then there's also empirical evidence that demonstrates that celebrities have a huge impact. And one of the best examples, of, co of course, is the Jolie effect. Have, er, has everyone heard of the Jolie effect? And people, who hasn't heard of the Jolie effect? Okay. So the Jolie effect is as follows. Uh, a couple years ago, Angelina, Angelina Jolie wrote two very thoughtful op-eds, and they were thoughtful, uh, in the New York Times. And these op-eds were about her decision to get genetic testing and prophylactic surgery. Uh, and they were thoughtful, and they were, weren't preachy. And they were basically Angelina just talking about her own decision-making uh, in this context. Uh, and she, as you know, got prophylactic surgery uh, as a result of her genetic tests and other factors. She has a very unique risk profile, which is important. But as a result of those two op-eds, what was born was the Jolie effect. And the Jolie effect is as follows. You can, again, don't need to see this study closely, but just see the trend. That arrow points to when she wrote those op-eds, uh, and the other, other bars are... Uh, the utilization of both genetic testing and prophylactic surgery. So these are two very serious, complex decisions that are being influenced by a celebrity. For better or worse, and we can have a discussion about whether this is good or whether this is bad, but we can't deny that a celebrity has had this impact. Now, some people suggest the headline about a study suggesting it is bad, that it has led to, to inappropriate prophylactic surgery. Uh, 
For our purposes, it's, the point is she's had a dramatic impact. And there are a lot of other studies showing uh, celebrities having similar impact uh, on cancer screening behavior, again, for better or worse. There was a very recent example of this. You guys know this one? And that is Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller claimed that PSA testing saved his life. I actually got in a Twitter war with Ben Stiller. That doesn't happen every day uh, on this very topic. Uh, and again, Ben Stiller's op-ed was very thoughtful and, and it wasn't sort of sensationalistic, but he clearly says that prostate, we should all get PSA testing uh, because it'll save your life. And I argue uh, that the evidence didn't, didn't support that position and he didn't like that. Who's the public going to listen to? Ben Stiller or this idiot? <laughs> uh, so you have that kind of phenomenon. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples of the impact of celebrity culture, uh, and this is cosmetic surgery. Uh, again, the reason I like this example is the direct impact it is having. The norms for, celebrity uh, for uh, cosmetic surgery are driven by celebrity culture. Uh, and there's lots and lots of evidence of that. Why do I have Middleton up there? Because that's the nose that everyone wants. <laughs> and it's pretty fabulous, uh, but that is, you know, that's the nose that people are requesting. In you know, five, ten years, it'll be a different nose. Uh, but the, the impact it's have, that celebrity culture has in this domain, domain is really astounding. Do you guys know what the, the fastest growing form of cosmetic surgery is right now? Because of one person, one data point. Yell it out if you, you know. No one wants to do it? It's butt enhancement. And that's because alone, it's because of Kim Kardashian. And here's the, the stats, which are really astounding. Um, that, you know, that they've had that impact. In fact, the Kardashians are kind of reshaping how we think of aesthetics, which is amazing, right? Uh, they're having a, a huge impact on, on, how, on how people are using cosmetic surgery. I, I picture this universe where every one of us looks like one of the Kardashians. It's kind of terrifying. Um, but that is a very good example. Uh, and the other thing that celebrity culture does um, is impacts, and I believe, and we need more empirical evidence on this, is actually interesting work from my colleagues at U of A on this, is our motivation for doing things. Um, celebrity culture is all about aesthetics. You know, they'll, they'll talk about health, but it's really about aesthetics. Now, for, for my book, uh, the Gwyneth book, one of the things I did uh, is I read every single People magazine cover to cover for a year. Uh, <laughs> it was really hard, you guys. <laughs> I thought it'd be kind of fun and frivolous. But it became tedious so fast. Um, I had, the rule was I had to read every page, including the ads. Um, and then after I finished the book, we actually hired a grad student to redo it and actually code it and do it kind of systematically. And one of the things that we found was that it is all of, whenever they're talking about health and when they're talking about weight loss or fitness, it's really about aesthetics, right? Looking good. And why is that problematic? Because if you are working out um, or eat healthy for, for the purposes of looks, you're less likely to succeed and less likely to be happy with the results because those are extrinsic goals, right? As opposed to doing them for intrinsic reasons. I, it makes me feel good. I want to be healthy. Um, those extrinsic reasons, you're more likely to be successful and more likely to be happy with the results. But celebrity culture pushes us towards the extrinsic. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of evidence to support that. Um, I'm going to skip over that. Look, I'm not naive. Uh, I know that we have always had this, sort of this idealized form um, and that we've always aspired to that form. Now, my brother's an art professor. I asked him quite often, and I asked him for uh, an image that really touches on that, you know, that really talks about how we've had, always had this idealized form, uh, what we're all supposed to look like, you know, sexy abs for the guys. Uh, and he gave me this great, uh, which I think is a fantastic image. It's one of the Dutch masters. Really beautiful. Uh, and so I love this image for a whole bunch of reasons. And one of the reasons is I'm curious, what's that guy looking at? <laughs> what's going on there? <laughs> Looks curious, <laughs> a little frightened. But we've always had this kind, of, uh, Im this kind of imagery. So yes, but the problem is that celebrity culture, again, is, you know, pushes us towards that, this idea that we're supposed to have this ideal form. And I think that that, uh, that is problematic. The well, last example I want to use for the influence of celebrity culture and that this matters, and this is not obviously a scientific poll by any stretch, but I think it's still amazing. So recently, Reader's Digest did a poll uh, asking who the 100 most trusted people in America are, okay? Uh, and the results are, are shocking. Uh, the top three are Tom Hanks, 
Sandra Bullock and Denzel Washington. Celebrity, celebrity, celebrity. The most trusted people in the US, right? They could have picked anyone. Uh, going down the list, you got Alex Trebek, woohoo, Canadian talk show host, way to go. Uh, you have a couple scientists, nice to see that in the top 20. Then Oz, Dr. Oz, still in the top 20, even after all of his, the controversy that has surrounded him. Let's go a little further down the list. You got Johnny Depp, right above the Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where is Barack Obama on this list? Oh, way down the list. There's Barack Obama, 65th, right below Adam Sandler. <laughs> Can't you picture Barack reading it? Michelle, Adam Sandler. <laughs> so we have, look, it's absolutely everywhere. I, 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 there's no doubt that celebrity culture is having an impact, uh, and there's some interesting re research suggesting why. My question is, what's happening? Why, why, is, why is this noise getting through and science not getting through? Why is science losing this battle all the time? Now, in order to talk about this, uh, I've decided to organize it, my thoughts, because around my hate mail. I get a lot of hate mail. Um, because there are a whole bunch of, uh, obviously, this is a very complex area. So I just want to pick a few to highlight, and I'm going to pick the ones that I often hear in my hate mail. So here are some examples of actual hate mail that I've received. <laughs> um, look at this effing idiot. What's next from you, uh, you soulless bastard? Now, can you guys read the top one there? <laughs> How small is... Look, this one deserves a little bit of an explanation, I think. So I wrote... This was in the response to an article I wrote about homeopathy. And it was in the National Post. Uh, and this person was enraged. Now, I think that... Um, do you guys know what homeopathy is? You guys know how it works? So I think homeopathy um, is absolutely scientifically absurd. So it's one of my, again, favorite topics. You don't have to pull any punches. It's just nuts, right? So the way homeopathy works is you take some kind of active sub of substance, like a root or herb, and it's supposed to sort of s simulate whatever condition you have, a cold or something like that. Uh, and because like cures like, and you take that substance and you put it in water, and then you dilute it to non-existence, right? So it's, it, the water is supposed to, it, like there's no longer an active agent in there anymore. The, the, the water is supposed to hold the memory of the substance. And in fact, the more diluted it is, the more powerful it's supposed to be. Did you guys know that? So the more diluted it is, the more powerful it is. The smaller, the more powerful it is, right? The smaller, the more powerful. I think that's a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Why, thank you. I don't know if it's small, but... <laughs> um, so what am I hearing in my hate mail? Um, what am I hearing from people who are frustrated with my com comments about science and, and why some of these things that are being said are wrong? Well, I think we can learn from this, and I think this is important stuff, because we, we should listen. The first thing I hear is the science is bad. Why should I listen to researchers when the research you do is bad? Right? And I think that this headline, which might be the best headline ever, captures the, this sentiment perfectly. <laughs> I think that it is, you know, we have concerns about replication. We have concerns about big pharma. We have concerns about industry in general. Uh, we have concerns about hype. That's stuff that we need to listen to. And we, we, the public needs science they can trust, right? And if we give them an excuse not to trust it, that's problematic, right? Uh, we see that they're in the area of food and exercise, uh, but really all over, right? And that's why it's been called, I think, the war on science and why there is this loss in, in trust and something that, it's something that we need to take seriously, uh, and especially when you see headlines like this. I'm sure everyone saw this. And when, I, when this headline came out, I had a lot of people email me and said, see, see, we can't trust science because it's, it's bought out. That's problematic. Uh, the other thing that we, I hear is... Um, we can't make up our mind. <laughs> uh, we keep changing what we have to say. Um, bacon is good for you. Did you guys know bacon was a superfood for a while? <laughs> Did you guys know that? Bacon was a superfood. There's all these reasons you're supposed to be eating bacon. It's good for you. Uh, and then about a year ago, uh, bacon had a really bad day. <laughs> you remember that? The WHO saying it's a carcinogen. It's as bad as cigarettes. Now, there's problems with both sides of this story, of course, but for our purposes today, it's this confused messaging. And I could talk about wine, I could talk about chocolate, I could talk about breakfast, 
Um, all of we keep changing our mind, right? And the public sees that, and they think that that somehow is a critique of science. Right, which is something else we need to take seriously. So the public is very confused, right? We have a very confused public, uh, and evidence shows that. This is a study that was done a while ago. I refer to it often because I think it does a nice job illustrating how confused the public is. America's, Americans find doing their own taxes simpler than improving diet and health, which is remarkable because we're going to come back to those six things, right? It's really remarkable. Um, and here's a study showing that this does create confusion, obviously, but more importantly, it causes the public to start tuning out, right? They don't listen to the experts anymore. They don't listen to guidelines anymore because they, they start to tune it out. The other, other force at play here, of course, is social media. Um, a very powerful part of the story. I don't know how many people are involved in social media, but look, celebrities own social media. They own it. It's their, it's their forum, whether we like it or not. And to give you a, an example of how powerful that this, they are on this forum, I'll again turn to my friend Katy Perry. Here she is holding all the supplements she takes in a day. That's what she, she takes 20, if you believe celebrity literature, <laughs> she takes 26 a day, 26 different supplements every day. Uh, she lives a vitamin life. Uh, why do I care? Why do we care what she tweets about? How many followers does Katy have? You guys know? Almost 100 million followers, right? She has almost 100. So there's interesting research going on. We're doing research in this area ourselves. It talks about the parasocial relationship that is developed between the public and celebrities, and that enhances, you know, when you get a tweet from, from a celebrity, it feels like they're talking to you. So there's interesting work that suggests that that, that kind of connection influences the power that they have over individuals. But to give you some, some perspective here, so Katie has almost 100 million followers. The World Health Organization has 3 million followers, right? How many do you guys have? <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Let's go. I mean, it's great that you have one. That's the important thing. Baby steps, right? <laughs> Baby steps. Um, but that's uh, social media, a huge influence in this domain. It creates these echo chambers, right? Uh, the other phenomenon, of course, is this, what I think is the embrace of pseudoscience, tolerance. Uh, for pseudoscience, which I think is very problematic. Now, this is where I'm going to get more controversial. Not everyone may agree with me on this stuff, uh, but I do think it's a problem. There is great tolerance for pseudoscience, um, and particularly in the area of health. So here's Jenny McCarthy. This, this is an image from her, her well-known, uh, her I guess famous, appearance on CNN when she was talking about the role of vaccination in, in autism. Uh, and I don't, you probably don't even remember this or know this, she was on the show with two experts. I think they were both from the CDC, both probably PhDs, spent their life studying this. And who gets time? Jenny McCarthy, right? You can imagine these guys, you know, these from the CDC saying, what's going on? And, and who do we remember from the show? We remember Jenny McCarthy, right? There, we don't give this kind of fault, we don't have this tolerance for this kind of false balance in other domains, right? We don't have this kind of tolerance for pseudoscience in other domains, at least not as much. Yes, you know, climate change has been issues, et cetera, but it is incredible how, how much tolerance, and it's almost politically incorrect in some domains to critique it. You know, we don't have alternative physics departments, right, or integrative engineering departments, right? You don't have a Reiki expert working on your jet engine before you board the plane, right? Um, but in health, and I understand these are socially complex, there's cultural issues at play, there's personal experience at play, there's relationships with healthcare providers at play, all that's true. But just because it's complex, I don't think we should tolerate the, the pseudoscience. Now, to be controversial, let's talk about Reiki for a second. Right? Um, if, I know that people, there are people out there that, that appreciate it and, and feel better from it, but let's be clear what we're talking about with Reiki. Reiki if you believe Reiki works, there, you believe there's a life force energy that runs through your body that you can manipulate with your hands, right? That's magic, right? And so if we you know, aren't prepared to critically uh, talk about that, I think we're being a little bit dishonest. We end up with this kind of situation. Um, thank you, Stephen Hawking. And now for a different perspective on the movement of the stars, we'll turn to an astrologer. Um, and this, this kind of false balance really matters. We can just say it's annoying if you're a science person, but it has social consequences. Um, it has real social consequences. This is an interesting study that shows that just being exposed to false balance and these kind of portrayals has an impact 
on vaccination intention, right? Vaccination hesitancy. Remember we had a study earlier that said that about 25% of the population is vaccination hesitant. So we're not just talking about these hardcore anti-vaxxers, we're talking about concerned parents who are trying to decide how to move forward, the best way forward. And if you're expo ex exposed to this kind of false balance, it can have an impact. There's also interesting study, studies on conspiracy theories, same thing. You don't have to be a hardcore conspiracy theorist to be influenced by that kind of rhetoric. So this matters, right? This matters. Um, you also the, have to understand the impact of the anecdote, of the narrative. And that's really what's going on here. You have Jenny McCarthy's, and I could use a lot of other celebrity examples, telling a compelling story about how vaccination caused her kid to have autism. That's a powerful story. Uh, and when uh, you have that kind of story versus st statistics, too often, the story wins out, and there's lots of evidence of that. Uh, and again, I think we need to uh, be clear about what we're tolerating and the impact, the social impact of this kind of tolerance. Here is uh, just a few examples, right? Just a few examples of homeopathy being um, proposed as an alternative to vaccination. On, these are websites I, I collected very recently. Uh, that's, those are ducks quacking, by the way. Um, that this is, uh, we have homeopathy being proposed as a alternative to vaccination, which is incredibly problematic, I think. Uh, we other, the other phenomenon that's going on right now that you may not have heard of that much uh, are quacka journals. This is a term that I'm trying to start. <laughs> Hashtag quacka journals. <laughs> What's a quacka journal? Well, there is all this what I call science exploitation out there. Uh, stem cell research is a really good example of it. You have people taking a real area of science and exploiting it to market a product. You know, things like skin cream and things like that. It's completely scientifically absurd. Then celebrity culture latches onto it. Oh, here's a great example of it. Um, a stem cell bra, right? I'm just gonna leave that up there for a bit and you guys enjoy the absurdity of this, uh, <laughs> of this product. But it's a great example of, it's in clinical trials apparently. <laughs> Uh, you guys can enjoy the absurdity of that. But this is a really good example of science exploitation, right? Taking this area, this exciting research, and trying to market a completely useless product. Um, and then celebrities get involved, right? You have Kim Kardashian getting a stem cell facial. Um, she had a $550 vegan stem cell facial, which I think is very interesting in itself. We're, we're, I'm doing a TV show, and we have to film one of these, these procedures. It's amazing, because it's, it's pretty invasive. It's pretty invasive, but people are doing it because they think it'll help. Uh, and they do it, and they try to support it with very questionable research. So here's an example uh, of what's going on here, what I mean by academic journals. So there is a phenomenon called, a, a product called the O-Shot. You guys heard of it? Anyone heard of it in the room? She's heard of it, okay. All right, the O-Shot. Uh, I know you haven't got it <laughs> done, because what is the O-Shot? The O-Shot is a... Um, Cells, the idea that you should get an injection in your vaginal tissue in order to improve your, improve your sex life, right? Uh, you're more likely to have orgasms. Um, I love that it says results may vary. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jan Jennifer Gunter, if you don't know who she is, she's a gynecologist from the U.S. She's awesome. She's got an awesome website. I just love her. She wheels the lasso of truth, uh, as she says, and she's awesome. And both of, we got in an argument with the person that was proposing this, this Charles Runnell, uh, who's an uh, MD in the US. And uh, we got an argument saying this was bunk, and we're doing a research project on, on this very topic ourselves, and we're saying this is ridiculous. And his response was, you know, read the research, Tim, and not Marvel Comics. And link to the great research in this area that he lead author on. So here's a pilot study uh, that he did of uh, 11 women. <laughs> 11 women, uh, it was open, there was no blinding, and this brought in 11 women and asked them about their experience with the O-shot. Uh, so methodologically, ridiculously weak, I'm not even sure they call it a study. Um, worse, it's published in a, what's called a predatory journal, right? So he paid to have this published, right? Um, so you have celebrities endorsing this, and then it looks like you have real research behind it. It gets worse, you guys. Um, I, you can see he's the lead author. He's also the corresponding author, the corresponding author, Charles, Charles Runnell. So um, he is, his address is Charles Runnell Medical School. Yeah. So let's look at the medical school. That's the medical school. 
Thank you, Google Maps. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure it's the dumpster, actually, or the, uh, <laughs> or the building. <laughs> but uh, that's the, a really good example of uh, you have celebrities, you have social media, and you have predatory journals really confusing the picture for, for people. Uh, and this is spreading all over the place. Just a few examples of the O-Shot being sold uh, in Edmonton. Right? So it's everywhere, and they're using these sort of of journals to market what they're doing. Um, I'll go over that. So we have pop culture. We have it clearly having uh, an impact. Pop culture is creating demands. It's creating expectation. And we have providers providing. Um, we have things, I think, associated with this. For sure, pop culture is causing distraction and confusion about how to live a healthy lifestyle. It creates financial loss. I'll give you a couple examples. And there's obviously many. Uh, there's physical harm associated with it. I think it has public health concerns, vaccination just being one example. And this next one I think we shouldn't downplay. I think there is an erosion of critical thinking associated with popular culture uh, that's problematic. I mean, look what happened in the United States, and I don't want to you know, make grand, grand uh, assumptions here, but I do think critical thinking is an important part of a liberal democracy, and, and this phenomenon is not helping. But I do think we can do stuff. I'm an optimist. I think we can move forward. Uh, I think there is regulatory responses that, that we can bring forward. Uh, we need to get more aggressive with truth and advertising. Uh, and that is happening in the U.S. on a couple of areas. This is the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, recently uh, put out, very recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a product in the U.S. Put on the label, this does not work. <laughs> That's truth and advertising. Uh, I love that. I'd like to see more of that, and we can do that here. I think that the relevant colleges and professional organizations can be more aggressive uh, when their members, like that Charles Runnell guy in the U.S., is marketing bunk, get more aggressive. I think we need to create a science-based standard of care, regardless of what profession you are. Uh, I think we need to have more policy statements from uh, things like Health Canada, from professional organizations. We should all get involved. Uh, we need to support independent science, of course. Uh, we need to get creative about how we communicate about these things. Uh, there's lots of interesting research about how narratives uh, can have a real impact. Na having stories. Now, I don't talk, I'm not advocating uh, anecdote versus anecdote. I'm talking about using narratives, using creative storytelling to get the science across, to get the real science across. Uh, some evidence uh, that this can work. And there's also evidence that fighting false balance can work. I think we really need to take an aggressive stand on this idea of false balance. There is science and there's stuff that's not science. I think we be, need to be more honest about that. This is a study using weight of evidence. So in other words, when media is reporting on this, when we're all talking about this stuff, we should talk about where the evidence lies. What is the weight of evidence on an issue? As you can see from this study, that can have a real impact on things like vaccination intention. Um, I, I do think we need to think of creative science literacy projects. We can talk about that um, in the question and answer. Uh, and the other thing I think we need to do uh, is we need to call it bunk when it's bunk. Now, not everyone may agree with that, uh, but I think it's important. I think we should step up as a scientific community, call it bunk when it's bunk, and there's some evidence that works and that can have an impact. Uh, here's a study about um, uh, how highlighting what the factual information says can, over the long term, have an impact in the context of vaccination. There are other studies that have shown that highlighting what the consent is uh, again and again can have an impact. Now, we have to be careful not to get in what's called the deficit model, um, because that, you know, this idea of just pouring facts on people doesn't necessarily change their mind. There's interesting research in the area of vaccination to that point. But, but there's also evidence that shows uh, that if you stick with it, if you're honest about it, and if you keep that message uh, going, it can have an impact. We've even seen that happen with climate change in the United States, where there has been uh, a slight shift in attitude. Uh, find trusted voices that you like, voices of science that you like. Uh, and these are just a couple examples. For, to, feel free to take a picture of this and spread the word. This is an ever-changing slide. I can't have all the examples there. But find voices that you like and tell people about them. Let's get out there. Let's get out there. And remember, all of this noise, all of this celebrity nonsense that we have been talking about is really about how to live a healthy life. That's all it's about, right? That multi-billion dollar industry, all of those celebrities, all that noise, it's really about how to live 
in life. And the crazy thing, as I said at the beginning, is I really think we do just six things. And again, I'm not talking about science, which is hugely important, or genetics. I'm talking about the things that celebrity culture always focuses on. Uh, so what are those six things? They're ridiculously obvious. I'll go through them very quickly because this is an incredibly informed group. Uh, the number one thing is you don't smoke. <laughs> uh, and that is, uh, it seems obvious to you guys, but you wouldn't believe how many people have come up, walked up to me on the street yelling at me about my position on gluten, uh, and they're smoking. <laughs> are you serious? Are you worried about gluten as a toxin for smoking? Um, I just interviewed a guy in Hong Kong who paid $10,000 for an assessment on his genetics about how he should avoid cancer, and you know what the answer is? He still smokes. I couldn't believe it. When he, I asked him on camera, do you smoke? He said, yes. It was like gold to me. Are you kidding? If you smoke, nothing else matters. Like It kills 50% of the people that do it. Um, number two, uh, exercise, real exercise, live a healthy lifestyle. Uh, exercise surpasses the effectiveness of any drug or other medical treatment. I know everyone here knows that, but that's a message that can't be said enough. Number three sounds like a cheat. I don't think it is a cheat. Let's see if you guys agree with me. Um, I think eat real food. I don't, there are all these fancy diets out there. I think for most human beings, it's lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, healthy proteins. There is no magic, right? There's no magic. Uh, but uh, celebrity culture, culture in general tries to make us think there's magic out there. Number four, I've all, often thought about collapsing it into number three, and I'm curious what this group thinks, because it is very hard to do, and the actual health benefits, again, there's a discussion going, but I've worked very closely with the obesity community, uh, the Canadian Obesity Network, for example. I've talked to public health people on this front, and I've decided to keep it in, and that's weight management. I'm not talking necessarily about weight loss, just talking about weight management, because I think that's part of a healthy lifestyle, right? Uh, weight management. Even if you don't lose any weight, uh, that's a good goal. Uh, number five is up just vaccination, wear your seatbelt. What's number six? Sleep. There you go. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think sleep is number six. And, and the data on sleep is increasing, right? It's becoming more and more. Now, I was thinking of adding seven, and the seventh one is, is relationships, and I think that's, there's actually good evidence about that. Uh, but as I said, these, all these things are ridiculously obvious. Everyone here probably could have said them before. Why do you highlight them? Because no one's doing them, right? No one's doing them. If you look at the data, it's just heartbreaking. I think this is generous, by the way, this data. Other st re more recent studies said 8%. Only 15% of Canadians meet minimum standards. We're not talking about people getting fit, minimum standards. Uh, this study from the U.S. I use all the time because it's funny. <laughs> they say only 5% this part's not funny. Only 5% do any vigorous exercises, which is grim. What is the number one moderate activity in the United States? Not walking. Close. It's food preparation. <laughs> right? Right? That's, that's, that's the world we live in. Um, here's another study. Only one in a thousand. This was from the AMA. Uh, they had seven items. Do all seven. One in a thousand. Right? Here's another study found. Only 3% to the top four. Gwyneth, this is the world we live in. We shouldn't be worried about steaming our vaginas or <laughs> all these other crazy things. We should be focused on the basics. We shouldn't let celebrity culture pull us from the basics. We shouldn't allow it to confuse the story for all Canadians. Uh, we should fo focus on those basics uh, and just turn to celebrity culture for what it is, a source of fun and enjoyment. So I'm going to end there and say thank you very, very much for this opportunity. I hope we have time for discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you.